Friends, I want to encourage you to turn with me, please, in your Bibles to Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 18. We'll be in Matthew 18 in just a moment before coming up to to give a word that God has laid on my heart. Uh, After the girls sang, David leaned over and said, dude, just send us home. (laughs) We just about could. You know what occurs to me, girls? By the way, that was absolutely beautiful, beautiful. The crispness, the clarity, the cleanness of those five voices that sounded like one voice. And it occurs to me as I'm listening to them sing, as we are all being blessed by their voices and the message of what they were singing, it occurs to me that is exactly what we are intending to do every time we gather in this place. With a multiplicity of voices, we gather together to make sure that we leave as one voice, clearly proclaiming good news in this world. So already, in a way more profound than what you're about to get dished up from me, these girls have preached our sermon already. Yeah. Thank you, girls. Amen. So, our youngest son, Jackson, comes home today from study abroad. He's been in, in, in Italy for the last semester. He comes home, we pick him up tonight. I was thinking about that. He's in the air right now, flying home from Istanbul. And it reminds me of something. I didn't expect to be thinking about this this week, but it reminded me of a moment when we gathered in the airport about 11 and a half, almost 12 years ago when we were coming to visit you in a call where you would call us and our family to live here and me to be your pastor. Suckers. <laughs> And I remember one visit that we came up is one of the earliest visits and we flew into the Atlanta airport and our boys were young. Jackson was just fourth grade, but he looked like about a second grader. You remember, some of you do. He was tiny and he'd always wear this this big fedora. That was his style. That was his drip. His his fedora that kind of hung down over his ears. And he was, he weighed like 30 pounds soaking wet. He was nothing, nothing. And we're going through, we land and we get off the plane and then we have to go to the plane train to get on the plane train and and go on down to baggage claim. And so we're all there, it's hustling, it's very busy. We get on, we're waiting, the doors open and then we all get on the plane train to to leave and everybody's kind of tight together. We turn around and, and Jackson's not paying attention and the doors close. And it's as if it happened in slow motion, those doors close, he looks up and his eyes are like saucers. And he's like, and I said, don't move, <laughs> stay there. And I know the plane train kind of took off fast, you know, like it normally does, but it felt in my heart like it was taking about half an hour to get to the next stop. We got to the next stop and I promise you, I broke every land speed record known to humankind running back to the previous stop. I was knocking over old ladies. I was knocking over blind men with canes. I'm like, out of my way, Mr. Magoo. I got somewhere to go. And I finally make it back to where he is and he's standing there petrified. I scoop him up in my arms and my heart was racing and his heart was racing. Adrenaline was was coursing through my body and I was so so grateful, so grateful to have scooped him up and that he was there. All these thoughts go through your mind, you know, as you're running back, not nearly fast enough. And I'm so grateful in this moment. Oh, okay, buddy. Okay. Everything's fine. Okay. Love you. Love you. Set him down. And then I'm like, if you ever do it, you want to... You know, it's both, you know, it's like love and sorrow flow mingled down. Well, I just wanted to... And it occurs to me, I remember that surge of emotion when I see the door close and I, he's separate from me and, he's, and I'm separate from him and, and he can't, and I can and, and, and it occurs to me that if I, a broken man, an imperfect man, an unholy man, am able to love with that kind of fierce love and celebrate with that kind of fierce joy upon reuniting with that which I thought I may have lost, how much more would the heavenly father 
rejoice over any one of us who may believe we have been shut off from divine love forever. We are told in sacred scripture that God rejoices more than anything else. He rejoices over the ones who were lost and have become found. Would you read with me in verse 10 of chapter 18, Matthew 10, 8, Matthew 18, verse 10 reads this way, take care that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you, in heaven their angels continually see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, Does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of your father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. We're told, in, oh, when Jesus describes his mission on earth, that in one place, in Luke's gospel, he said, but the son of man comes to seek and to save the lost. That the point and purpose and passion and pursuit of our Lord is singular, to seek and save those who are lost. And I'm talking about that today and it's important for us to be mindful of that truth today because here we are nearing the end of a sermon series that has been focused on what it means to be a church at this address. I've been saying for several weeks that the church of Jesus Christ is intended to be the visible presence of the risen Christ in this world. And for several weeks, we've been trying to imagine what it might look like to tangibly, literally become the evidence of his resurrection here at this address, at 6910 McGinnis Ferry Road. But but if it is the chief aim of God to seek and to save the lost, and if it's our chief aim to make sure as a church we are in alignment with the passions of God, then my question to you is this, if it is the chief aim that not one is left lost, not one is left alone, lonely, abandoned, overlooked, and if it's our chief aim to be in alignment with that God, then my question to you is simply this, who's your one? Who's your one? It is my conviction that God has placed in every one of our lives someone who at some level is in a season of lostness. And God sometimes does that. God sometimes will mess with you, will put somebody in your life, back away and watch to see what you do with it to see how you might steward God's own desire to seek and to save the lost. Who's your one? Now, before I I dig deeper into what I'm asking you, before I even unpack what it means to consider who your one is, I think we need to do a little language study here. I think we gotta be very clear about what I mean when I talk about the lost Because for a long time, I think maybe we have talked about the lost and the found in ways that are unfair. Sometimes we think that the lost are are these folks over here and the found are these folks over here. We sometimes buy into the lie that lost and found are binary terms. That these are the lost people and these are the found people and I am, you know, in the found. When the truth of the matter is, there is lost and found in me. There's lost and found in you. In scripture, if we read the scripture too casually, we will come across these binary terms like clean and unclean, holy and unholy, Uh, sheep and goats. 
And we assume that there are some people in this life that are unholy, unclean goats. And there are some who are clean, holy sheep. And just, it's ironic that the odds are usually the people who think that way account themselves among the sheep. Isn't that true? The truth is, if I had time to preach today about Matthew 25, you know what I would do? That's not my assignment today. The Lord has given me a different assignment, Monty. But if I were to preach about Matthew 25, you remember that story. And Jesus says, at the end of the age, the king will gather all before him and he will say to some, hey, enter in to your rest, to the sheep. He will say, enter in because I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink and I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was sick and I was in prison and you visited me. And the sheep will say, oh, but Lord, oh, we never saw you in those conditions. How, how did we know? And the Lord will say to them, anytime you treated anyone in those vulnerable conditions with dignity, class, and love, you have done the same to me, so welcome in. And then that parable says, if I had time to preach it, Jim, I would say that that parable then says, to the goats, he will say, away because I never knew you because I was hungry and thirsty and a stranger and sick and in prison and you ignored me. And they will say, uh, but we, how, I don't, how'd that happen? We didn't know, we never saw you. And he will say, anytime you ignore the vulnerable in this life, you have ignored me, now away with you. And typically we interpret that passage, that parable this way, ah, Well, at the end of the day, there will be sheep and there will be goats. And I just don't think we've interpreted it well because I know that in me right now, there is sheep and goat. There's a little bit of sheep and a little bit of goat in all of us. There's holy and unholy in all of us. I think what the parable is intending to say is at the end of this journey we call salvation, redemption. At the end, only the sheep in you remains because he has taken care of the goat that is in you. And, and yet, when we talk about what we're talking about today, see, that's, that's what I would preach if I had time. But since I don't have time, I'll, I'll stick to the assignment. If we were simply preaching about what it means today to be lost and found, I think that we're both a little bit lost and a little bit found. You can go through seasons and have experiences that send you into a state of lostness where a cloud kind of comes down over you, a fog over you, and no matter what you do to clear the fog, you just don't know where you are anymore. In fact, I want to be very clear with what I'm saying. If you've given your life to Christ and you've come to a place where you have yielded your life to the transformational love of God in Christ, you are found. And so when I say we can be lost and found at the same time, I I don't mean you can lose the love of God. I don't mean you can lose your salvation or your security in Christ. As we're told in John's gospel, the 10th chapter, it's as if you are a sheep and the shepherd has scooped you up and none can pry you from the father's hands. And yet, even in our foundness, We can be lost. I believe that you know somebody in your life this day who is experiencing a kind of lostness in the soul, in the mind, in the heart. Who's your one? See, in the Luke's gospel, we just read this parable a moment ago about the sheep and the 99 and the one gets lost and the shepherd goes after the one and leaves the 99. That's Matthew's gospel. But when Luke tells the same story about the, the, the parable of the one sheep who got lost, he does something interesting. In chapter 15, he threads this story about being a lost sheep. You know, all we like sheep have gone astray. He threads this story about being a lost sheep to another story about being a lost coin. And he threads that story to another story about two lost sons. And it's possible if we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear that the conditions of our lives can at times put us in a state of lostness in which we need to be found if you know anyone who has been lost overlooked, bypassed, neglected, forgotten, abandoned. I want you to think this morning about who's your one. Can we talk about the sheep for just a moment? 
In Luke's parable about the sheep who got lost, who takes off and, and is now lost from the shepherd, it's important to remember that we, we, don't, we know that no sheep ever wants to be lost. I mean, a sheep wants to be in the fold where there's safety and the security of having the shepherd look over the sheep. No sheep wants to be lost or intends to be lost. And I think the sheep at times reminds me of those seasons in my own life when I don't intend to end up where I'm going, but you know, I I end up like a sheep. A sheep will graze this grass and without looking up, will continue to eat this grass that's in front of them. As long as they're grazing this pasture, they will continue to walk in such a way as to take them in places they never expected to go because they never look up. There could be a sermon somewhere about what it means to live a life where you never look up. Nose down to the grindstone. You just, you just move and you're just doing life. You just, and all of a sudden, it's not that you don't want to be close to God. It's not that you, you somehow intend to move far away. You just look up and how did I get here? And, and I, I started out over, and I don't even know how I got here. I was just doing life. And I look up and, and now it's just so far back. I, I, it's not even, I don't even know if it's worth the energy to get back, and I don't even know if I could make it back if I could, and so there's a kind of lostness that comes without us even knowing it. And sometimes you do the thing that maybe you shouldn't have done, or you don't do the things that you should have done, and you just, you wake up and you realize, I don't know how I got that far away, but I I just am. I don't wanna be, but I don't know what to do about it. I meet some people who experienced this after COVID. Do you know after the pandemic, here we are four years after it began, And we've been talking about what it means to be the post-pandemic church, for the post-pandemic church to rise, the body to rise again. And I will still meet people in our community who used to go to church here. And I'm not kidding. And I will say to them, hey, I've not seen you in a while. How you doing? Oh, we're good. We're good. Hey, we've been missing you. Yeah, yeah. You know, we watch watch online sometimes. And no kidding, somebody recently stopped me and said, hey, you know, it's it's great. We still watch. And they quoted the sermon that I preached like four years ago. (laughs) I'm like, "Where, where are you? We've been missing you. And then I'll hear something like this. Yeah, I don't know. I Nothing happened. I mean, we're still there. That's our church. We just, I don't know. We just, we got out of the habit and, and then out of the habit, it got easier. Do you remember when we were in COVID and every, every Sunday we would give you these videos of worship? Remember this? And we would literally have communion every Sunday. Do you remember that? And, and I would have bread here in a cup and I, we'd videotape and I'd say, hey, go somewhere in your house and get some crackers and, and get some juice or some kind of something in a cup because we're gonna have communion and we would do it every week. Every week, we like, this is how we're gonna stay together when we're apart. And most of us began to do that. And after three, four weeks, I was like, well, I just, I, I just, I got coffee. I'll just do coffee. And then it's fine and it's gonna be fine. And then, you know, since I've got coffee and it's recorded, I'll just watch later in the afternoon. But of course, later in the afternoon, it's really pretty and, and everybody's walking out in the neighborhoods now, it's COVID. I'll just, I'll catch it on Tuesday. And eventually you don't catch it on Tuesday and, and you think you're gonna make up for it, but then the next Tuesday rolls around and now you got two to make up for and then 20 to make up for. And then eventually we came back to church, remember? But we came back to church and we were wearing masks and we had blue tape all over the pews because we couldn't sit close to each other. And some came back and said, ah, thank God we're back. And others came back and said, eh, it just doesn't feel the same. And so we'll wait until we come back and it's real and we're doing the full thing. And then for whatever reason, just doing life, just one foot in front of the next, it's not necessarily that something was done, but a series of something's not being done is just as lost. And you know somebody like I'm describing, don't you? Everybody knows someone who loves the Lord and loves the church and loves their family, but something has happened and over the season that they've been living, they're just in a place like a sheep who has wandered into a space and yet the parable tells us that when the shepherd goes and finds the sheep, do you know what he does? He picks up the sheep, he stoops down low, puts him around his shoulder and carries him back and he celebrates with everybody else. Look who I found. I know that somebody in your life is waiting for you to find where they are, stoop down, down deep where you can lift them up over your shoulder and bring them back here. Not literally, but maybe bring them back here. Who's your one? 
Who's waiting on you to say, man, I've been missing you. Would you, can I pick you up? Will you come sit with me? And the parable there continues, and it's not just about a lost sheep, because sometimes we get lost, and it's not because of something that, that we intended. We just end up far away from where we thought we would be. But we're also told that the lost coin tells us about a different kind of lostness, that this woman had a bag of, of 10 silver coins, and, and suddenly she lost one of those coins. And in losing one of the coins, she turns the house upside down until she finds it. And the lost coin represents a different kind of lostness in my opinion, because the coin didn't do anything to get lost. I mean, and Luke doesn't even describe what occurred in order for the coin to be lost. I mean, was there a hole in the purse? Was it dark when she was counting and she fumbled it and it hit the ground and rolled in the darkness to a space that she couldn't reach? I don't know. And Luke is unclear. And I think maybe that's the point. It's because we all know somebody where something has happened in their life to them. And they received a diagnosis or they endured a trauma or have gone through a season of trouble or of loss. And in the jilting experience of what they have under, undergone, it's as if there was a, a hole ripped in the fabric of the purse that had held their life together. And now, against their own desire, they have fallen in the darkness to a place where no one has been able to reach them yet. See, there is a kind of darkness that comes over us and a kind of lostness that we can experience, not because we chose it or wanted it, but because life happens, and I have said to you before, sometimes it's not your fault. Sometimes it's just your turn. And everyone in here knows somebody who is enduring that kind of lostness, where a cloud has come down over them, and they feel as if life has overlooked them and bypassed them. They've been neglected, abandoned even. Do you know somebody in that kind of lostness? Because the woman in the parable shows us what to do with it. God is imaged as a woman in the parable who, when she can't find the coin that has been lost, turns the house upside down, knocking over furniture, lighting up lamps in order to find the coin. And somebody in your life is waiting for you to knock something over, make a little mess to get to where they are because nobody has been able to reach them yet. It might be that you are being called to embody the love of God that is demonstrated in that woman. But then again, there's another kind of lostness. And this third story is maybe the most familiar story of all. We call it the parable of the prodigal son or better term that we've said before is the parable of the loving father. But for our purposes this morning, I might want to refer to it as the parable of two lost sons. If you're familiar with the story, you know, this dad has two, two boys, an older and a younger and the younger one comes to the father and says, I want all of the inheritance that is planned to come to me when you die. It was as if to say, I hope that you would just already die so I can live with my, my stuff. And so the father gives to him his inheritance and we're told in the story that he does what we might expect him to do. He goes off into a foreign land, a distant land, the text says, and squanders it on what the King James refers to as riotous living. <laughs> a life of just debauchery and licentiousness and spending all of his inheritance on that which he thinks would satisfy in a distant land. If we had some time, we might talk about the reality that the distant land is that place where all of us go when we leave to find the thing that we had the whole time. And there he is and he's feeding pigs because he's hired himself out to a, a workman. He's hired himself out to feed these pigs. And have you ever gone through a moment where there was a wake up call and in that moment suddenly the, the scales fall from your eyes and there is an awakening. How in the world did I get here? And, and you realize, yeah, I know how I got here. Sometimes there's a kind of lostness that comes that is so clear because we've blown it. You know, I told you a moment ago that sometimes it's not your fault, it's just your turn. <laughs> but sometimes it's your fault. 
And he wakes up, he says, I don't know what I'm gonna do because here I am, I'm at a place where I know I'm lost and I know why I'm lost. I have blown it, so I'll go and tell my father, look, father, I don't deserve to be welcomed back into your home, into your love, but if you hire me as a slave, then here I am, and you know the story. He comes back and on his way back to the father, the father sees him in a distance and does something that the father, a father of notable stature in the first century would never do. He girds up his loins, holds his tunic and runs out to meet him, embraces him, brings the signet ring, the robe, the sandals on his feet. This is my boy, he's back now. Kill the fatted calf and the celebration begins. And just as the smell of barbecue is wafting through the work fields, the big brother who had always done the right thing, who had never left home, who had always played by the rules, says, what's, the, what's with the barbecue? Oh, your brother is home and your father has killed the fatted calf. Come, let's celebrate. And we have a story where the older brother filled with bitterness has a confrontation with his father. What are you doing? I've done everything you've ever asked me to do. I've never left home. I've played by the rules. And you've never thrown a party of any size at all for me. And the father, in that moment, embraces him, I imagine, and says, but son, everything I've ever had has always been yours. This brother of yours was lost, and now he's found. He was dead, but now he lives. And the story ends with the older, the older brother and the father in dialogue while on the inside there's a party going on and we don't know if the older brother goes into the party or stays out. It's left ambiguous. And you know why? Because we all know someone in that kind of lostness. The younger brother reminds us of a lostness that is traditional, predictable, easy to spot a mile away. You blow it, you had grace, you threw it away. But the older brother reminds us of a different kind of lostness, to have had grace your whole life and somehow be under the illusion that you have earned it. To somehow believe you're born on third base and you think you hit a triple. Here you are, I've done everything right. And there is a kind of lostness in a pigsty of your own making where you slip around in the slop of self-righteousness And you and I both know somebody like that. And yet in the story, the shepherd comes and picks up the sheep. The woman kicks over the furniture and finds the coin. But in this story, the father is both the one who runs to someone who has truly blown it and the one who embraces the one who is blind to his own graces and says, there's room for you too. And the reason I ask you this question, who's your one, is because I believe every one of us knows somebody in that kind of lostness, one of those kinds of experiences that leaves them in a place where they feel as if the the doors on the plane train have closed and they are far removed from anything that looks familiar or like home. And if you and I at 6910 are to be a church that is in alignment with the heart of God, we must be ourselves in alignment with the calling to meet the lost in whatever state of lostness they may be and embody the love of God in whatever state that calling presents itself. That's why I ask you, who's your one? It's kind of why we come to the table. Because the truth of the matter is you and I can't find our one and embody the love of God and enflesh the welcome and foundness of God to those who are lost until we come to grips with our own lostness. Until you and I both are aware of the places where we could have been abandoned and left alone and yet the words of the old song we used to sing in contemporary down the, down the hallway come to my mind. Unless you're able to sing these words as your own testimony, as a prayer to God, that there's no shadow that you won't light up, God. No mountain that you won't climb up, God, coming after me. 
There's no wall you won't kick down, no lie you won't tear down coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give your love away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. I wonder if you know those words as your own prayer. Have you allowed God to find you in whatever state of lostness you may be experiencing? My friends, we come now to a moment in our service where, and deacons, you may be seated. Thank you so much. Where we move toward the most important moment, and that is, the benediction that allows us to scatter into this world from this gathering and to live in this world as if we actually believe everything that we've affirmed in this place. But as we prepare for that benediction, it might be that today you have found yourself in a place of decision where you feel compelled to make a decision of spiritual significance. Maybe there is a nudge within your heart and God is calling you to be found. Or maybe in your foundness, God is calling you to partner with God in loving someone else into the faith. Whatever the decision may be, maybe today it begins with a simple prayer. And if you don't know the words to pray, perhaps these will do right where you are. God, today I yield myself to you. This bread and this cup has reminded me of what you have paid for my being found. And I pray that you would forgive me of the places in this world that I have broken things. And I pray that you would heal me in those places where the world has broken me. And from this moment forward, I desire to follow nothing but you, giving you my whole heart and my mind and my life. I want you to be my Lord and I want to be your follower. I pray that in the name of Christ. Amen. So friends, you, you may be in a space today where that has been your prayer. It might be that you come today recognizing that God has been up to something in your life and it's now up to you to do something with that. That's why our pastors at this time are making their way to the front of the sanctuary because at the conclusion of our benediction, when we dismiss, you are invited to come and speak with one of us so that we might pray with you, listen to your story, and maybe discern together what God is up to in your life so that you may be able to decide what your next step is. It might be that you come to give your life to Christ for the very first time. It might be that having given your life to Christ, you recognize that you can't do this life alone and you want to do life here with this family of faith and become a member of Johns Creek Baptist Church. You come and tell us that today. It may be that some of you have been waiting baptism, waiting for the opportunity to express from those waters that you are his and he is yours and you want the world to know. Whatever the decision may be, don't wait another week to make it. Come today as we pray with you, right at the end of the benediction. But now it's time for us to do that most important thing, to turn this gathering into a scattering in the name of his love. So as you're able, would you stand to your feet for the benediction? It is my prayer, beloved sisters and brothers, that wherever it is that you go from this place, remember what you have seen and heard here. Remember what you have tasted and touched here. And remember that Christ will go before you to prepare your way. Christ will go behind you on the days that you fear and feel like retreating to encourage you one step further at a time.
Christ will go to your right and Christ will go to your left, abiding closer than even a sister or a brother. Christ will go above you on the days when dark clouds roll in to remind you there is one above the clouds who at the end of the day has the final word. Christ will go beneath you, girding you with confidence and removing all forms of fear. But mostly know that Christ will go in you, transforming you from the inside out until your hearts beat in rhythm with his.